Okay, so something is not sitting right with me about the largest ever worldwide IT infrastructural outage in history. One billion computers bricked and already most of the world has forgotten about this incident as it has been basically overshadowed by a flurry of other news. Now let's talk about the sequence of events and yes, another war has started between Yemen and Israel. More on that in just a moment. We need to talk about what has happened in the last seven days alone. We've had an assassination attempt on a front-running presidential candidate, okay, which would have resulted, if it was successful, in some at least moderate intensity civil war. We've had gold nearly touch an astounding $2,500 USD. That's unheard of just six to eight months ago, okay? Nobody thought that that was going to happen. I mean, people are saying it for years, but to see it actually happening is something else. Of course, that was until the plunge protection came in and it retraced back to 2400 but it's not going to be there for long. We've had the resurgence in the intermediate nuclear forces arms race between Russia and the United States, with the Americans committing to now place Tomahawk missiles, long-range Tomahawk missiles, into Germany that, of course, can be nuclear-tipped, and the Russians will respond in kind with the weapons and in the region of their choosing. We've had a war now flare up between Israel and Yemen after an unprecedented attack on Tel Aviv with an Iranian-made drone shot by the Yemenis. I'm not sure how... It was able to get past Israeli defenses. Apparently, five of these were shot, and the United States Navy took down four in the Red Sea. One happened to make it through. I guess the lauded air defense of the Israelis is suffering uh, under the attritional weight of the Hamas and Hezbollah war, which is also ongoing. We've had the Joe Biden fiasco. Every day, another rumor is circulating, the latest of which is that Hillary Clinton is going to be the replacement. We have had, of course, the largest ever IT infrastructural outage in world history. Now, this is what I want to talk about today and all of these things. And then, of course, we had the RNC convention before I get into that, which was very conveniently overshadowed just an hour afterwards by this massive cybersecurity incident. Now, they're saying it wasn't a cyber attack, and we don't know if it was. The cybersecurity experts I've spoken to don't believe it was. That doesn't mean it was not cybersecurity related, because we're going to talk about an interview that the CEO gave to USA Today, which was one of the most suspicious interviews I've probably ever seen. And I know that these tech CEOs, maybe, you know, they spend a lot of time on the computer, so they're a little bit antisocial, so they're going to stammer in their words a little bit, but this was different, okay? And we're going to talk about the reasons why. But isn't it interesting that this impassioned and heartfelt speech given by Donald Trump, and you guys know I'm apolitical, I'm as upset by Trump derangement syndrome as I am treating Trump as some kind of demigod. So both of those things uh, repulse me greatly. And in fact, when I start to see it go in one direction or the other, I start to, I'll either defend Trump or I'll, you know, when people start equating him with some sort of godlike messianic figure, then that's when I say, okay, this is getting out of control. All right. Especially when you have Hulk Hogan tearing off his t-shirt and that if that's not reminiscent of the movie Idiocracy, I don't know what is. And yes, I have a whole piece coming up on that particular event and why it signifies the downfall of Western civilization incarnate. Now, isn't it convenient, though, that to take the wind out of the sails of that movement, which was pretty epic. I mean, you had Dana White, you had uh, Kid Rock. I can't stand Kid Rock, to be brutally honest. I just simply cannot stand the music. I think the music sucks. I think just I, I don't know why that guy's popular. Um, he's like the WWF of music. I, I just don't understand it whatsoever. Anyways, uh, it was a pretty epic convention. And this completely overshadowed that. That would have been the talk of the town. Were it not 
for this worldwide outage and people not being able to go to the banks and getting stuck at the airports. And that is now the talk of the town. The question is, what the hell was the real purpose of all of that? Because three digits of code, three digits of code was what caused one billion computers to get bricked. Now, the CEO did not explain the nature of the reasons as to why this error happened. They just said it was an error and they were apologetic about this. But it does not explain why they wouldn't have uh, some sort of mechanism to prevent such a thing, especially if the implications were so massive. Now, obviously, they're updating things on a regular basis because, of course, they're a cybersecurity firm and it's the constant arms race in cyberspace. I'm by no means a technical expert. I'm not a coder. I did read a coder's explanation of what happened, which is why I understand that it was, in fact, three digits of code which caused this thing to not work and which caused all of these computers to have to go be put in safe mode and manually rebooted with a different driver. Now therein lies the potential insidious aspect of this. Were they doing something? Were they up to something? Number one, was this, okay, there's several explanations. Was this a trial run for something bigger? Were they setting us up for something bigger down the road? Was this to take attention away from what was going on with the RNC and all of the momentum that the Trump campaign had. I'm not so convinced about that. But of course, when you look who's behind CrowdStrike, they're the guys who are behind the Julian Assange case. They're the guys who like the prosecution against him. They're the guys who are uh, basically, uh, what was the other, the, the Russiagate situation in 2016. Okay, they were the ones who were involved in that. They're owned partly by BlackRock. People always say mistakenly that BlackRock owns things. BlackRock owns shares in things. So it's not that BlackRock owns entire companies, but I believe, and I could be mistaken about this, that they are one of the primary shareholders of CrowdStrike. And BlackRock is kind of the new faceless boogeyman, which it's so convenient to have a, you know, to, to have a boogeyman like that because you can never put a name on it, like an actual individual name. You can say a CEO, but then who's really pulling the strings? So it's convenient that everybody's like World Economic Forum and BlackRock control everything. Well, what does that really do for you? How, how are you going to fight something that doesn't really exist? So it, it's almost a, a ploy by the elites, I think, some COINTEL operation to ensure that you actually don't go looking for names. But anyways, I digress. So why is it that they that they made this error, which according to cybersecurity experts, and this is when I have to look at my notes because I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but uh, there could have been a potential placement of either some kind of Trojan in the rebooting process onto people's computers, or this could be for the purpose of preventing a cyber attack. Maybe they anticipated that something was coming. Is this priming computers because they need computing power to do some widespread denial of service attack? Should World War III start? Is that what this is about? Because we know, and it was interesting, I just listened to a Netanyahu speech about this last night where he, he said verbatim that we can bring down countries with the push of a button. Okay, with a push of a button, and we've done plenty of videos on cybersecurity before. We've had cybersecurity experts on the channel. And indeed, there should have been uh, what are called like compilers and AI compilers that would audit and I guess proofread this, this code. And beyond that, though, you know, beyond just making sure that the code was sound, why would you roll this out? worldwide at the same time and why did it only affect Microsoft is the other thing now again I'm sure there's an explanation for that but I think we can infer that if it's that easy to bring everything to a grinding halt so quickly then and to take attention away from everything is this a message that they're trying to send I mean when you really think about it uh, if they're saying they don't have an internet kill switch but if CrowdStrike is automatically updating and updating to 
uh, people's, uh, these different corporations' servers, then they can essentially have the power to take down everything if they wanted to, okay? Was this a test of that? You know, I mean, we really got to ask a question because this just makes no sense whatsoever. I have a sneaking suspicion that this in some way, as most things seem lately, related to World War III. I think they might have been trying to do something with these computers and and have done something with these computers in the same way that some people speculate. I don't know if I should get into this. I don't know if I should get into this, but some people have speculated. I think we're well enough in the clear that the most recent health emergency that spread across the globe in the last four years may have been aided in its spread by the inoculations that were supposed to prevent it. That's all I'm going to say. Was that the case in this instance? There's something going on here, guys. There's definitely something up with this because you just don't have this many unprecedented events happening in such a short period of time. The nuclearization of Russia, the gold price, the war in the Middle East, the Trump assassination, and the biggest IT outage within the span of a week? I mean, these are things that, that are supposed to happen maybe quarterly, at best, yearly, really, any one of these things. And they're happening so frequently now, and people are so desensitized that it's, you know, it, we're just like, when's the next disaster gonna come? And this, I guess, is what you would expect. Maybe this is the same thing that the people in the Gaza Strip feel when they see home after home and death after death. You just start to become completely apathetic towards it because it's just one thing after another. Maybe that's what's happening here. But I tell you, something is afoot with this. I think that this was done in preparation for war. Now, the CEO of the company did an interview with USA Today. And I've never seen somebody so nervous and make so many embarrassing blunders within an interview. There was a point where he was so clamped that he had to get some water. He was choking. And, uh, you know, he kept using the terminology, our adversaries, our adversaries, almost as if it was incredibly second nature. And speaking from like a condition reflex response, whereby he was told that he had to do something from some superior, but he was he was free associating, or what would the term be, a parapraxis, a Freudian slipping, if you will. He must have used the term adversary half a dozen times in that interview to explain that the, our goal is to, you know, secure things against our adversaries, and this is the power with this centralization of control of these big tech firms and this one really does take the cake because they're connected to everything okay and once one of those systems goes down I mean the irony here is that they were supposed to prevent this from happening and they ended up causing it so if they can cause what they're supposed to pr prevent doesn't that make them the biggest potential enemy out there should they decide to just have a bad day and go turnkey totalitarian on everybody something isn't right about this now today and then of course it also papered over the Tel Aviv strike and then today you have the Israelis targeting a port in Yemen now the Yemenis have essentially declared war on Israel I mean they already pretty much have they've been firing ballistic missiles at Ilat I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that properly but that port has effectively been closed They've essentially brought traffic in the Red Sea to a grinding halt. The, uh, what is it called, the Suez Canal is slowed down significantly, if not almost altogether in, on some days. And uh, this, of course, is uh, causing the price of oil to skyrocket. No, it isn't, because, of course, that market is manipulated also. I tell you, this is absolutely insane. So what's going to happen now is that the Houthis have said, look, if you are helping Israel to attack us, whether that be allowing them to refuel their planes over your territory or shooting down our missiles before they get to Israel. We're talking to you, Jordan. We're talking to you, the United States. We're talking to you, Saudi Arabia. Of course, that's number one. Saudi Aramco is on high alert right now. You can be assured. 
And they're saying that they're going to declare war on anybody. Now, the Houthis are just another arm of the IRGC and the Iranian military. Even the sound of the drone that was used sounded exactly like uh, the drones that, you know, Iran, the Shahid drones that they've been sending to the Russians. I don't think it was a Shahid drone, but of course the Iranians are going to deny any involvement in this. Saudi Arabia has denied any involvement in this because neither of those countries want to get into a direct entanglement with the United States and Israel, but it very well is going to happen because the Houthis just simply don't give. I'm not going to swear. I know I've been swearing too much in the videos, not because I, I really give a shit, to be honest, and there I just swore. It's just I, I don't like the energy it emits, and I find it's intellectually lazy to. And once you go down that that uh, path of swearing a lot, it, it just takes the I don't know. You, it If you use it too much, if you use it gratuitously, then it loses its effect. And I want to save my F-bombs when things are really urgent. But you know what? Fuck it. I mean, in the last week, we have seen more than um, some generations seen in 10 years. Literally, an assassination attempt. The biggest outage in history. I mean, these things, uh, the gold skyrocketing, the nuclear arms race, Cold War kicking off again. I mean, but, you know, you look outside. And in most places in the West where we're insulated from a lot of this, people think that the buck is just going to stop here. But it's not. It is going to, and Lavrov said this distinctly, he said, the United States think they're going to be immune from the repercussions of a broader war in Europe, and they are wrong. And in fact, Lavrov came out today and said something interesting. Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, he said that Israel thinks that we're just going to sit on the sidelines of this war with Yemen and Iran, but we're not. Which essentially means that, of course, as they now have economic and increasing military partnerships with Iran, they're very likely going to start militarizing in some respect or trying to interdict Israel's onslaught on Yemen or on Iran, if should that arise, to try to act as some balance of power within the region in the same way they were in Israel. Now, they haven't turned the S-400s on in Syria yet. They haven't Turn, given the S-400s to the Iranians. Of course, they could, and perhaps they've given them the blueprints in order to make something similar, maybe a more diluted version. But essentially, the Saudis are denying any involvement. I don't think the Houthis believe that. Per se, the Houthis are going to continue to bombard Tel Aviv. They said that everybody should leave Tel Aviv. So now Israel's in a situation, and Netanyahu's loving this because, of course, the longer they stay in a state of perpetual war, the longer he stays out of jail. So now he's got wars on multiple fronts. He's got the war in Gaza. He's got the war in the West Bank. He's got the war with Hezbollah. You could argue that there's a war raging right now with Iran and the Iranian or the Iraqi Iranian backed militias. And then of course, Yemen is now a full blown hot war after the scenes coming out of there today. Probably one of the biggest explosions I've seen in some time. This involved around a dozen F-35s and F-15s. This, these were massive bombardments, okay? Massive attacks on critical infrastructure. So we know that the shit is hitting the fan. And how convenient that something like that just happens on, you know, right after the markets close. All of this stuff starts to happen as oil was low. I'm suspecting that maybe Nancy Pelosi invested in oil on Friday. I guess we're going to see on Monday. Of course, you have Anthony blinking 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 you might as well call him blinking a stammering idiot he is now saying that the iranians have the capability to build a nuclear weapon in one to two weeks well i mean they've been saying this for the longest time and sure the iranians likely have the capability to do so but isn't it funny how now you have an iranian president after the other one mysteriously died another you know black swan event i mean just the fact that iran and israel came so close to war and the president died in a helicopter crash and that's not even talked about anymore is crazy okay anyways the fact that this guy comes out and he's like look i want to bring back the jcpoa i don't want nuclear weapons a much more dovish approach and in fact he was elected partly on that platform of being an anti-nuclear weapons president, but I think mostly on the fact that he embraced more liberal policies, more uh, Western adjacent policies within his own 
country because the people there, you know, they do remember, I think, the Shah and uh, that whole thing. Anyways, so what this means then is that Blinken is basically now solidifying the need for a U.S. intervention because in the same breath he says that the United States will not allow Iran to become a nuclear power. In January 30th, go back and watch my video from January 30th, I said that before the election, and I think I, if anything I'll only be wrong by a few months once Trump gets elected, we will see a war with Iran. Now recall, two months later, we almost had one, okay, when the Israelis took out the generals in uh, Lebanon, or was it Syria? I think it was Syria. They took out the Iranian consulate, and the Iranians fired 300 missiles and drones at Israel. Everybody thought that that was the start of it. And uh, so I was right, but, you know, it didn't progress, thank God. Now, I don't think that's going to be the case, because they've already basically checked off all the boxes. They passed House Resolution 559, which indicates that Iran can't have nuclear weapons. And if they do, United States will come to Israel's aid. They did that, geez, probably nine months ago now, right after October 7th. So we know that the shit is going to hit the fan eventually. I said it on January 30th, as clear as day. You can go and watch that video that I released. In the first minute, I predict that we will see a war between Iran and it's just so obvious, you know, especially with Trump and Vance and how, I mean, he has to go to war with Iran. He has no choice because they have an arrest warrant out for him. And then making all of these uh, insinuations that Iran is behind or was plotting to assassinate Trump, you know, while it was just some like scraggly looking white kid, 20 years old, you know, and not to speak to his race or anything, but it was the complete opposite of an Iranian. You know, it was just some like, I don't know what you would call him because they say he was Republican uh, Party. But I don't want to get into conspiracy theories about that because it's like, you know, what's the point? It, it's a rabbit hole. JFK, they're still trying to figure that out. So uh, what I'm trying to say is he's the complete opposite demographic of an Iranian IRGC back terrorist organization okay so the fact that they're trying to somehow make that relationship that oh yeah we were actually you know waiting for an iranian terrorist attack okay or an iranian assassination attempt it's like okay you know so now everybody associates in their mind oh maybe it wasn't the iranians but iranian you know assassination attempt iranian and that's all people here because people are busy people are trying to keep pace with inflation and just how much things suck so they know that people don't have a lot of bandwidth to devote to this stuff and that all it takes now is for the Iranians to do something bad and then they can kind of harken back to, oh, remember when we were trying to increase security because the Iranians tried to assassinate Trump, even though there's no like evidence that the public has been given about that. But what we do know is that there's a dead 20-year-old kid who clearly had issues, mental health issues and otherwise, who is responsible for this, okay? So the Blinken talking about Iran being able to produce fizzle material is a market shift also from his tone of a more dovish tone. I know that sounds crazy, but Blinken has uh, re refrained from using any sort of inflammatory rhetoric in the Middle East because it appeared at least for some time they were trying to rein in the Israelis a little bit. But now, of course, he is talking in the same way he did in Ukraine up until about a month ago until Bulasov, the Russian defense minister, called up Lloyd Austin and said, stop fucking around or we're going to start shooting your shit down. Uh, then he's now pivoting to the Middle East because it's lower hanging fruit, so they think. But we could see oil prices go through the roof if the Yemenis on the back on the basis of or basically at the behest of the Iranians start attacking Saudi Aramco then it's game over and then you also have the Chinese today I've been informed they are now becoming less dependent on Saudi oil and more dependent on Russian oil this the Chinese were 
somewhat of a mitigating factor in a war in the Middle East because they, of course, stand to benefit from low oil prices. If a war breaks out in the Middle East, China is absolutely screwed. So they don't want a war in the Middle East so long as they're dependent on that oil. As soon as they are no longer dependent on that oil and they can get cheap oil from Russia in abundant copious amounts, they're not going to care as much and they're going to go all in on Taiwan. And perhaps right now the stakes are such that all of these wars are unconnected. So you have record amounts and this is something I haven't even talked about. This is another unprecedented thing that has happened in the last seven days. I have to keep my window open because it's freaking hot here. It's very loud outside. I apologize. The Chinese are mobilizing in and around Taiwan and the Philippines unlike ever before seen. We're talking about dozens and dozens of warships, okay, and incursions into the Taiwanese airspace. Now, maybe China doesn't want to make its move because the Americans are saying, okay, we know where you get your oil from. You go into Taiwan, look, we know that we're limited in our capability to defend the Taiwan Strait. We get that. But what we do know is that we can cause a war in the Middle East, which will cause oil to go to $300, which will crash your economy. And we have oil that we've kept underground. And a lot of people think that we're doing this for environmental reasons, but <laughs> little do they know it's a matter of national security and why take it out of the ground and export it when you can just keep it in the ground instead of storing it in some strategic oil reserve. The strategic oil reserve for oil is the stuff that's already in the ground that they could tap that they aren't tapping for environmental reasons. Okay, so this could be the move here and so you you have to look at all of these conflicts as being interlinked because the chinese can't make a move unless their bases are covered in the middle east the russians can't make a move unless china has their back and it's a very complicated state of affairs and a lot of people try to look at these theaters of conflict in isolation but it's not until and if you really want to get a sense of how putin and Xi Jinping and the new president of Iran and all of the people involved in this think you have to think in those terms because this is the the level of chess required in order to, to truly play the game whereas we see things as the public one dimensionally we see one issue at a time oh Yemen just did this we see things mostly tactically we see the big explosion and we see, oh, that bad. But we don't see that in the much broader regional context and then that in the much broader global context. So it's a complicated state of affairs to say the least. Then you have Netanyahu coming to the United States next week. I'm sure he is uh, not going to be very welcome by a lot of the protesters who are going to be there to greet him. I'm not even going to talk about the Biden situation. All you need to know is that all of his donors are backing out. For example, Michael Moritz, billionaire Silicon Valley venture capitalist, has said, sadly, President Biden has a choice. Vanity or virtue, meaning pack your shit, get the hell out. We don't want to support you. And according to AOC, in probably one of the most candid it wasn't an interview. I don't know if it was an interview or if she was just doing some monologue for the camera for her YouTube channel or something. But she basically was, for the first time, maybe not the first time, but she was very sincere in this video. And she said, look, they don't want Biden or Kamala in there. And that she's in the rooms where these people and these donors and these high-profile Democrats are discussing this, and they don't want either of those two. So it's going to be interesting to see what comes of it. Now, interestingly, there is an EU ploy right now to get Ukraine military aid. And Ursula von der Leyen, she said that she wants to do an integration of Ukraine, Moldova, and the Western Balkans into the EU. Now, in addition to that, she also wants to create a military aspect to the EU. So the European Union, the difference between the European Union and NATO, as far as I understand it, is NATO is a military alliance, whereas the EU is an economic and political alliance. 
So it's yet, it ceased to be a military alliance. I mean, there might be some in terms of the economics of all that in industry, but by and large, it's not a military alliance. There's no, there's nothing that stipulates that if one country is attacked, another country has to come to its aid. A country might choose to do that and form bilateral uh, agreements with said country. But it's not like NATO where they have Article 5, where if anybody is attacked within the alliance, all of the alliance is obligated to assist. But cleverly, what they want to do is first bring Ukraine and these other countries like Moldova and the Western Balkans into the EU, and then they're going to militarize it. So then you have a situation whereby you can offer Ukraine military assistance without invoking Article 5, which I'm not sure if the Russians are going to see through. I'm not going to, not sure if they're going to perceive it to the same degree as a nuclear threat as they would because some EU countries, of course, do possess nuclear weapons. But it seems like a very interesting scheme that she is trying to develop. What else do we have to talk about today? We got two more cases of bird flu in Colorado. Interestingly, most of these have been mild symptoms. And it makes me wonder why they're keeping it under wraps. You know, are they trying to let this thing spread? Is the Pfizer CEO biting his toenails right now? I was going to talk about some information I received about Poland, but I'm going to save that because this video is long enough. And we've just talked about so much, or I've talked about in this parasocial relationship so much. But I got some intel on what's going on in Poland, and it doesn't look good. Don't take your eyes off what is happening in Ukraine. All this talk about peace with Ukraine and blah, blah, blah. It's all just to buy time. It's just a, a short-lived detente in hostilities. The real war has always been with Russia, China, the United States, and everything else is a proxy. If you want to support the channel, feel free to check out CanadianPreparedness.com. Trying to get you the best quality gear that you're going to need to ride this out. I mean, imagine if you could not access ATMs. Imagine if you couldn't use debit machines. Are you truly ready for that? Are you truly ready at any given time to not be able to get gas from the pump, to not be able to transact online, to not be able to have street lights and 911? And, and I mean, we've just seen clear as day that they could bring the whole system down. And that was just with three little snippets of code, okay, with this firm that's been entrusted to secure basically the bulk of the internet that matters enough that it could bring down all of the uh, infrastructure, the critical infrastructural services that we've come to require in order to build this very sophisticated, well, it used to be sophisticated, not so much anymore, civilization. And they can just shut it off in so many ways. My friends, Please do not get complacent. Please enjoy your summer. Please enjoy your families. This is a very short life. We should not live a, a life of angst, uh, obsessing about such mundane things. But we should also be aware that the times we're living in are just different than any other time in human history. There's never been a time in human history where there is so many ways to bring down the system and that is largely due to the technology that we've come to enjoy it's a double-edged sword and i'm not a technophobe i'm not no unabomber type okay i love technology but at the same time it's a double-edged sword the bigger they are the harder they fall and we are in the age of consequences so please if you don't want to see your family suffer you need to take it upon yourself to do whatever you can to be, and I'm going to bite somebody else's rhymes, I'm talking about Elliot Hulse from Strength Cap. you got to be the best version of yourself you can possibly be. And this day and age, that means learning self-reliant skills. That means being prepared, having the gear, having the provisions. Instead of spending however many thousands of dollars on tickets to basketball games, I would consider investing in your own insurance policy that you know you're someday going to need. 
Thanks for watching, my friends. Stay safe. Canadian Pepper out.